What's going on, guys? It's Justin here with Summit Racing. I'm Andrew Markell, and today we're talking about drilled and slotted rotors and if they do make a difference in terms of braking or uh, they're just cosmetic. And we've kind of went down a rabbit hole doing the research for this and we've watched a whole bunch of different videos and to understand where this thing gets started. And it's really tough to really define who drilled the first rotor. But disc brakes, what's some of the history on that? So disc brakes are kind of cool. You know, the patent was at somewhere in the early 1900s, a company had patented, patented the first disc, you know, disc brake system. And then it was used on some odds and ends kind of stuff through, you know, the 30s into the 40s and got really popular after World War II. And I believe it's somewhere in the 50s that like a mass automobile um, manufacturer like Citron actually used it on the front of their cars. And then the rest is kind of automotive history and it's gone from there. I mean, General Motors, they made the ploy in, was it 73 or 74 to have everything disc brakes. You know, you see that on their brake pedal with the big disc on it. And uh, from there, I mean, racing-wise, I think the first one was probably 1953, the Jaguar C-Type at Le Mans, um, with the girling disc brakes. And that was one of the first that ever came up that, you know, really made the difference for a lot of drivers because that one could go the whole race without having, you had to change the brake pads and maybe a set of discs, but it didn't, it had more stopping power than the comparative drums of the day. Yeah, and just like everything in the automotive industry, you know, it's it breeds in racing, you know, from, you know, Le Mans cars all, you know, into F1 and stuff like that. And then that technology trickles down into the stuff we drive on the road. So if you look at a modern automobile, almost everything comes equipped with disc brakes all the way around. And if you ever drove a car with four-wheel drums and then you get into something with disc brakes, you're like, man, this is, it's, I mean, that's the cat's pajamas. Like, uh, drum brakes are cool, but, you know, Disc brakes is where the stopping's at. I mean, I have a car with drum brakes, and it's amazing because it has that delay valve that kicks in the rear brakes and then allows the front brakes to work. And just to get all of the shoes out there and everything else, they still work great at stopping the vehicle, but there's some drawbacks compared to disc brakes. Yeah, disc brakes, you know, drum brakes have a lot more maintenance involved, per se, compared to like a disc brake system. You know, you have all these, you have springs and levers and all sorts of stuff that moves. And that stuff, you know, it's a bunch of wear items. Well, everything wears a little bit and then, you know, you get sloppy brakes, the, the pedal gets soft, you have to adjust them from time to time. You know, with disc brakes, it's a lot more maintenance free. So, you know, if you have an old car that came equipped with, you know, four wheel drums, swapping a, there's a lot of great companies out there that make disc brake conversions for just about everything. I mean, this is probably what we're commonly seeing on a lot of just regular cars. It's just a disc. I mean, this one has the flange and hub built into it and the races for the bearings. And this is pretty basic and probably something you'd probably see in probably the 1960s, 1970s. Maybe it was solid at that time. But you really look at how far it's come probably in the past decade or so. Yeah, and that's like another cool thing like Andrew just mentioned, you know, solid rotors versus vented rotors. And that is kind of the first step in braking technology when it comes to disc brakes is going from a solid rotor to a vented rotor. Most everything now is equipped with a vented rotor and it's actually kind of cool how they work, you know. Back, it was explained to me at one time that a vented rotor works on a hope and a prayer, and that's not, there's some real science there. So with the vents on the inside, as that's spinning, it's flowing air through it, and that's actually cooling it down because in, in brakes, heat is the enemy. So you want to make try to maintain the system's temperature and keep it cool for as long as possible so you don't get a bunch of brake fade or anything like that. And the, you, see you get squishy pedal, you heat up the fluid, and then you have no brakes. And it gets, it gets really scary really fast. I'm sure you've been in a car where, you know, you overheated the brakes and there's no more stopping. Like I said, you're kind of crossing your fingers a little bit there and it gets a little daunting. We have our first question that just came in here and uh, we have it on video right now. My name is Kara Smith. I'm applying to the C-Tech program and I am wondering how a, brake, a lighter brake rotor can outperform my heavier brake rotor. And what that means to the driver, the vehicle, as far as weight being the issue. Because I think weight does matter to a brake rotor. Yeah, there's there's a fine line and it's a balancing act. So a heavier a heavier rotor is going to has more mass to it, so there's more metal there. So it's going to dissipate heat better. 
Now on the adverse side of that, a lighter rotor is going to be it's going to be lighter, less rotating mass, but it's not going to absorb as much heat and you're going to get heat soak into the pads and into the caliper and the fluid and you're going to get some brake fade. So there's a happy medium there to what kind of it really depends a lot on your car, you know, weight, how big a tire on it, how fast you're planning to go. There there's there's a lot to that equation, but generally speaking a in a race application, a lighter brake rotor is going to perform better than a heavier brake rotor. Yeah, I, I got to agree. You know, it's the performance of just the ability to have that much mass in the corner of a vehicle to dissipate the heat, but it also comes down to the surface area. And also the uh, shape of the vents. I mean, they could be curved. It could be the number of uh, veins inside the rotor itself that make the difference between, you know, that absorbing and transferring the heat to the outside air because I mean, these don't have radiators in them and there's the only way that's going to release the heat is through the veins and the plates and it's going to try to prevent that heat from going into the head of the rotor to damaging maybe the hub or anything else like that. So you've got this area called the heat dam and it, it varies on different rotor designs. Yeah, there, there's a hundred different rotor designs out there, actually probably more for different applications. And, you know, everybody's kind of got their little magic secret and what makes their brake rotor better than their competitors. And everybody's got something different and there's all sorts of technology that's bred into this. It's, you know, it's not just a round disc that you clamp between a brake caliper. There's some real engineering that goes on with these things. So we've got disc brakes and now all of a sudden out there, I don't know if it was a fashion thing or I, I see some of the first racers, probably road racers, did the first holes into a brake rotor. Um, you know, it was, I, I've heard, Will Wood says it was road racers. Other people say it was a NASCAR guy. Other people say it was this, uh, well, you know, a drag racing guy. Um, you know, when did they start to do these rotors on, on different vehicles and drilling holes. I mean, and then when do you think it became a fashion statement? So it's it's definitely became drilling and sliding rotors has, like I said, it was bred on the racetrack and then it became into kind of, you see a lot of high-end supercars such as, you know, your, your Ferraris, your AMGs, uh, Lamborghinis, they all have these giant rotors with a bunch of holes drilled in them. And like I said, it definitely is a, a fashion statement in that aspect. But the, you know, it was bred with old brake pads and old brake technology when we were using asbestos brake pads. They put off a lot of gas. So the original idea was by having these rotor holes in the rotors, the gas was allowed to escape. And, and it's hard to think about that between as this is all going on and you're applying brakes and it's, you know, your clamping force, that you're getting this minute layer of gas in between the pad and the rotor and it's causing brake issues. So by drilling the holes in them, that was the first way to allow this gas to escape and then get a fresh, you know, you're getting that area back from brake pad to rotor contact and really getting your stopping force back. Now with modern pad technology and stuff like that, that's not so much an issue anymore. So I think it's kind of, it's became less of a necessity and became more of an aesthetic thing. And except drilling them, they're... There's several different kinds of rotors there, and we kind of, we should kind of step back a little bit. You know, we have solid rotors, we have dimpled rotors, drilled rotors, and then drilled and slotted rotors, and that's kind of the uh, the best of all the worlds. So a slot that basically helps to degas the pad and take stuff away from the surface too. Yeah. So the the slot in a rotor not only it's it's kind of doing the same thing as a dimple or a hole would do, and it's allowing that gas to escape, but also as the pad comes around. It, it, it's kind of adds a biting edge to the pads and allows it to fresh surface every time it comes around. The adverse effect of that is is pad wear becomes a lot more prominent compared to like say a solid rotor that's non-drilled or slotted. So it does have a slot in my opinion has more benefits and more it's better than say a drilled or dimpled rotor because you have a longer surface. It's cut like I said, as the pad comes by, you're getting a fresh surface every time. And also it allows the gas to escape. So you're kind of getting the best of both worlds. So in terms of these holes and uh, the slots being cut in there, is there any like one set pattern? You know, I know we, we see, we probably got four different brands of <coughs> brake rotors here and they all have different hole patterns in them. Do you see, you know, these ones look about the same with how they're shaped. How does that matter for a, a given application? 
So when it comes to like the shape, like I said, every manufacturer's kind of got their recipe that they want to use. There's 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 a company that does like a J style slot in the in the rotor, and they all do the same job. It's just you know people's it's, it's different takes on it. So by having this slot all the way across the rotor itself, you know you're getting a full as the pad comes by, you're getting a full slot across the pad. So it's not just going to say you know, have a small wear in the center and that's kind of just allowing gas to escape there. You want to allow gas to escape and do that whole deal across the whole surface of the pad. So there's de there's different patterns between manufacturers, but I think in the kind of the general sense, this kind of swooping diagonal line across the cal or across the rotor does a lot better job. So you'll see they're always lean. They're not just straight a, um, you know, kind of a straight line dr drilled across the rotor. They're always kind of swept back on a I'd call that like a 45 degree angle almost. Should you be concerned if that slot goes all the way to the edge of the brake rotor? In that aspect, I think by going all the way to the brake rotor, it's, you know, if it wasn't designed that way from the factory, I think that would, um, if you have some kind of out outside wear issue, that would be a problem. But I think having the whole slot across it really, uh, or at least the most surface, if you cut it all the way to the edge, I think that would kind of add some issues with uh, rigidity and kind of how strong the brake rotor itself was. Because that is the downside of a drilled and soldered rotor. When you start to put these things through a lot of heat and really abuse and beat on them, you'll get cracking around where the holes are drilled and kind of, it's mostly with, with drilled, like actual drilled rotors, not like so a slotted or a dimpled. But when you have a hole all the way through it, it, it takes some it takes some meat out of the out of the rotor, and it's going to make it a little bit weaker, and you'll get some kind of cracking and fatiguing, and that's the time you need to replace them because it's the last thing you want is a rotor failure. Because when a rotor comes apart, it is not a good time. <laughs> Pretty scary stuff. Which we got another question that just came in here. Uh, let's throw that up on the video screen. How should a hole or slot be drilled or cut to prevent cracking? This is a great question. Yeah, so just kind of just like drilling any kind of metal, you know, heat is, heat is the issue. So when you're drilling these, obviously you're not, you could drill a used set, but it'd be preferred if you started with a brand new set. And, you know, you're going to drill them. You need to keep the thing centered. So putting this on just on your drill press and sitting there and drilling holes in it, it is not the move. So you'd want to put this like on a super spacer, on like a lathe or a mill, get the thing all centered up, zero it out, and then drill your holes in kind of a, the pattern needs to be the same. You just don't want to take random metal from random spots because a brake rotor is balanced. And if it's if you take meat out of it and you take the balance out of it, it's you're going to get a weird vibration. It's not going to be a good time. So drilling it, it it's kind of self-explanatory. You know, you're going to set it up. You're going to put your pilot, your pilot marks, kind of figure out how you want to drill your brake rotor. And then it's it's a monotonous process of slow drilling, he, it, it takes some time. Yeah. So lubrication, time, sharp drill bits are your friend. Let the drill do the work. You don't have to put a bunch of pressure on it. It's um, you know, a good drill bit is designed to cut through metal and it doesn't need your help pushing it through. We see on this brake rotor right here, the holes actually have a chamfer to them. And the same way with this uh, slot in there, it's cutting almost like a U groove instead of like a straight through groove. Is there any reason for that? So the, the point of the, the chamfer is, is you're keeping, A, you're just keeping meat. The whole point of the hole is for gas and stuff to escape. So by having that big hole and just kind of a small hole in the center, you know, you're maintaining meat here. And this is, this is kind of like a fresh cutting edge every time the, the pad goes around. So you don't need a hole that giant to get through. So yeah. you sit there, it's, um, uh, there, there's a particular word for you know that chamfer cut when you uh, it's kind of a back. It's cut like a eliminating yeah back cut or you're eliminating a stress riser in the uh, in the metal. Yeah, because adding a hole if you know if you had that that's a three eighths hole all the way through the rotor, you're taking a lot of meat out of there, and that's going to take a lot of you know strength out of the rotor itself by the time you drill you know 70 holes around the thing on each side. So you want to be able to keep as much meat in the rotor as possible while still getting the nice hole drilled through it for your gas escaping and that kind of deal. And from my experience it has been if you look at any brake rotor on the edge itself it's always a chamfer too and they do that initially to eliminate a lot of the stress on the rotor itself because if you have a nice sharp edge that's where cracks tend to propagate more and take on more stress 
from uh, the rest of the, uh, the, the casting. Uh, the casting itself is under different stresses as it heats and cools and heats and cools that the microstructures inside the metallurgy just go in and out, in and out, and that can kind of disturb a lot of the, the structure of the rotor to eventually it will crack if the, uh, the metal is just a little too hard. I mean, you see probably some brake rotor manufacturers out there that say G7, G10, G11. Typically that last G number, like a G10, is a harder steel than a G7. But that G7 rotor is able to generate more friction because it is actually just a little bit more softer it's able to generate more friction because it's a little bit more abrasive compared to a G10, which may last a long time um, compared to the other ones. So, and that's the thing is there's trade-offs in building your brake system and making, you know, a brake, say you're building a street car, or even like your daily driver and stuff, there is there is some proof in the pudding. So there's, there's so many different brake brake compound combinations and rotors available, kind of like Andrew said, in different metals and stuff like that. Some rotors, a, you know, a hard aggressive pad is going to wear a soft rotor a lot faster versus, you know, you have a hard aggressive pad on a hard rotor. Well, you're going to have the brakes to, for your brakes to work properly, you're going to need to get them hot and heat them up. And so something you drive on the road every day doesn't really need, you know, your daily back and forth to work car doesn't really need an aggressive pad and rotor but you know you get a hot daily driver you have like a, a street and strip car or a, you know even a car you take to the track on the weekends a, a good aggressive brake compound and a soft rotor may you know the soft rotors may wear faster but they're going to stop the car a whole lot better especially on the on the track so like if you're if you have a you know a, a car you drive to work and you take it to the track on the weekends, you have to think about the different braking cycles that thing goes through. So, you know, you're on a racetrack, you're scooting along, you're down the straightaway as hard as you can, and then you're in the brakes hard through the corner, back in the throttle. It's not like driving down the highway every day where, you know, I get in a little bit of traffic, nice gentle braking, it's, you know, come to a stop, hit a stop sign, that kind of deal. There's definitely not as much heat involved in that as, you know, you're beating the car around a racetrack or you know, an autocross course or whatever your fancy is. You know, and my experience has been people are hearing about stuff called like ceramic pads and the different types of friction profiles. I mean, you do have some IMETs, which are an abrasive type compound that goes against the rotor, but then you also have brake pads that have an adhesive type friction profile. And these are typically called ceramics or NAOs. And they're designed to work with a brake rotor to make it last a long time. And a lot of the vehicles out there come off the factory showroom floor with a ceramic brake pad. Um, and that brake pad is actually designed to leave a transfer layer across the front of the rotor. Um, that, that's actually what's wearing away a little bit of the rotor, but a lot of the transfer layer from some of the pads. And I think that those pads from PowerStop are, are similar to that in design, that they have that adhesive, if you hear that terminology in some of the tech articles, that they throw down that uh, transfer layer so the brake rotor will actually last longer. And I think you see a lot of those packages out there from some um, performance manufacturers where they'll package a drilled and slotted rotor and a set of brake pads. They're actually designed to work together. Yeah, and that's a big thing is you want stuff that works together. So you can, you know, you could buy a really set of expensive slotted rotors and then you throw an organic pad on it and it's not really going to, you're not gaining any performance from that. So, you know, you get a set of these PowerStop Z26 compound pads and a good set of rotors, and they're, they're designed to work together, and you're going to get better, better braking force, and I think you're going to be overall happier with what it feels like at the pedal, because that's what, really what matters. Before we're coming in here, we're talking about, uh, to one of our, our guys out in the, uh, one of our videographers, and he wants to put drilled and slotted rotors on his vehicle, and he is concerned about corrosion. Um, it looking even worse because he, whenever he does his own brakes, he sees the corrosion on the fins and then he sees it on you know, the hat and everything else. He's wondering if it has holes, it's probably just going to be even worse. Do some of the rotor manufacturers kind of take that into account? Yeah, so that's, you know, in that conversation we had earlier, we had, we talked about how GM uses kind of a revolutionary coating on their rotors, and it's, you know, it allows the rotor not to, it's a thin micro layer over the whole thing. It's almost like case hardening is what I'd call it. And that allows, you know, that allows them not to rust and do all sorts of stuff, like 
anti-rust. Um, it's it kind of cleans the brake pads. It does a couple of odd, odd and other things to you know help your rotor life last. And that's a big thing. Is like you know you have a project car or something that sits in the garage for a long time with some moisture and that kind of deal. You know, you look, you don't drive something for three days and you get that nice layer of surface rust around your rotors and you get to go drive the dust off it. I think Willwood right now, they're using an anodized finish on most of the rotors where you get it. So it ships to you. It looks greater. I think that what type of coating that they're using, it's like a PVD type coating. But when it eventually, the brake pads hit it, it wears this away. And then the areas that hopefully don't get rusty will stay black. Uh, make for a really cool look, but that's a that's another great thing is like coating them like that You know if they're gonna sit at a manufacturer on the shelf or in a parts house and that kind of deal like our warehouse at Summit Racing That's the last thing you want is the to pull a brand new rotor out of the box and, and be rusty And that'll be a lot of things you see when you buy like a, a rotor from a manufacturer that they come with something It's it's similar to Cosmoline was the old chemical back in the yep. day You could cover everything in. It's very important when you get a brand new set of rotors that you clean them with Brake Clean. Actually, you know, that's what actually Brake Clean is for: is cleaning the, you know, the protective coating off off the rotors themselves. Because the last thing you want to do is put this rotor on with this oily, greasy sus substance and pollute your brand new brake pad. And plus, the oily, greasy substance also would typically carry a lot of the metal chips from when the rotor was being manufactured. Sometimes too, and that was sort of getting those out would those chips would become embedded in the pads. Yeah, and that's the last, like I said, brake pad contamination is a is a big part of brake failure or, or poor brake performance. You know, if you have a, a, a brake fluid even gets on a brake pad or you have a, a leaky wheel seal or something like that and they get greasy, you know, brakes perform the best when they're dry and clean. So, you know, you add some contaminants into it like that and that contaminant can actually absorb into the pad and shorten the pad life substantially and even gets to the point where it can get bad enough for the pad itself will actually delaminate from the pad bracket and you'll lose a whole you know a giant chunk of pad and then you have that scratchy grindy noise that we all hear that we don't like <laughs> so we got another question coming in here um right now this is kind of a a really neat question what i think we have them on video are drilled and slotted rotors always directional So for the most part, I would call, you know, it, it, it is a directional part. So you want, you know, as you're bolting this on the car, they're like, um, yes, we actually have a great example over here. This one comes labeled from the manufacturer. And if you can't really read the sticker there, it says front driver's side. So you're going to want the slot in the self. It, it's going to want to be leaned back whatever direction it's going. Yeah. So if, it, if it's meant for the driver's side, they're going to be leaned back like this. Vice versa, passenger side they're going to be leaned back. You want that to kind of start at the bottom and the uh, as it's coming by, you know, you're going to want to start towards the inner side of the hat and then as it drags the pad across, you know, it kind of cleans it. You don't want it to come this this way is dragging out. If you put it on the opposite side, this is dragging stuff into the road, into your braking system. So it's not evacuating the gas how it's supposed to. It's It um, would almost be trapping it in a sense. And I think that also that matters for, in some cases, the veins of the rotor itself are designed to create this great fan type motion to, to draw the gases out of the rotor to, uh, you know, take air in from the center of the hub and then drag it out. And they, some of them are actually a little bit directional uh, for some of the manufacturers. Yeah, because I, I mean, that's with the vented rotor, that's how the whole concept works is it's, it's like your fan blade. I don't know if you guys have ever, you know, from you switch your ceiling fan from, you know, winter, kind of winter to summer, you want it to pull air one way and kind of push the air other. That works in the same basic aspect of it's, you want it to kick the air out. You don't want it to, kick, to suck it in. You're trying to get as much heat and heat out of it. So you want to get as much airflow through the rotor as possible. And this kind of fan blade design in there on the vent really helps that. So, in general, the, the surface of the rotor, how should it look when they put it on the vehicle? Should it have a non-directional finish? Just like normal brake rotors, like this one right here? Yeah, so if they if they are directional, it's going to come out of the box brand new. You know, these are labeled, they're obviously directional. So it's going to come out of the box, and it's going to have these nice, you can see in this one, it has all these cut lines from where they, they kind of, 
I don't know if you'd uh, call it like a finish honing or something like that where they cut it, but these, these rotors are ready to have a set of pads seated to them. So this is, you know, you can look at this pattern and see it's non-directional. It's just clean and it's ready to go. So this sort of uh, plays into um, a good question about the surface and everything else. And this is a good question. Let's roll, roll this one right, right now. Can a drilled or slotted rotor be machined on a bench lathe? I do. That's 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 a dinosaur. That's a, that's a good running machine. They don't make them like that no more. Yeah, I, I can take this one because yeah. I've actually I've actually done one. Um, you can do it. Uh, just two things to be careful. Don't try to take off too much at one time. Um, and kind of maybe slow down your cross feed. Just don't do like the the, the, the fast setting. I think it's in the in the center on that uh, Amco. And uh, just just take your time with it. Um, don't try to take too much off in one pass because you tend to get some weird harmonics. And then uh, make sure you're using the belt that goes around uh, the rotor itself and it can be uh, machined. I've done it once. You can do it with an on the car brake lathe. Um, but really looking at a lot of these drill holes and slots and everything else, they're, they're pretty much way below the, uh, the minimum wear specification for a lot of rotors. Yeah, if, if you're to the point where is, this is kind of, these are eating, you know, this is no longer here or you're bored to the hole, it's, a, it's time for a new set of rotors. And it's important, that's, that's something it's kind of hard to check, but yeah, having a out of round brake rotor or something where the surface isn't perfectly machined flat, that's, that's something to check and you're checking it with a dial, you know, you could put it, the cheap way to do it would be to put it on a, you know, wheel hub, throw a couple lug nuts on it, stick your magnetic dial indicator to your hub and sit there and check it and see how much out of round, how flat this surface really is. An ideal, in a perfect world, this should have no run out at all and should be perfectly flat. But as we know in the worlds of mass manufacturing, that's not always a thing. So in a, a hot, you know, a hot application or a race application, it, that, that is something worth checking. Are you going to notice it on your daily driver? Probably not. But on your race car that you could be doing 150 miles an hour in, it might be worth checking out. <laughs> so before they put on one of these drilled and slotted rotors onto a vehicle, something that's going to be their daily driver, what do they need to be doing to the flange on the wheel hub? So like when I pop an old rotor off when I'm doing a, just a simple brake job, I like to use 3M has some really great, they have that roll, that roll lock deal. And uh, I like to grab my Milwaukee right angle cordless die grinder. Thing is awesome. Don't even have to drag the air compressor hose out. It is, and uh, grab it, throw a roll lock on it. And then I just like to clean up the wheel hub, make sure there's no loose rust, debris, that kind of stuff. And then um, I prefer to put a little bit of never seize. Now, never seize goes a long way. You know, everybody knows a little bit goes a long way or else you'll end up looking like the Tin Man by the end of the yep. day. So I like to put a little never seize on the back, on the uh, back of the rotor itself where it's gonna mate to, to the hub. And um, just to kind of prevent some corrosion and make it for the next guy that's doing the brake job, you know, probably gonna be me. So I want it to come off nice and easy. So just kind of a little surface prep, nothing real crazy, just making sure everything is in nice usable condition. So, and that's an important time if you're doing a brake job to check some other things like your wheel bearing, how your brake, your caliper condition, your sliders, what your rubber lines look for. That's kind of all comes with a brake job to make, you know, it's not just pads and rotors. You need to check the condition and life of your entire brake system per wheel to make sure there's nothing funny that's going to give you an issue down the road. And we just got a message from Jack Stowe. He's the one with a lot of his students asking the questions right now. And uh, he says, hey, that old lathe, it's a vintage. Which... We love vintage equipment because just like everything nowadays, they don't make anything like they used to. And an old, one of them old giant heavy cast iron brake rotor, I mean, that thing will last three lifetimes. That's Oh, um... as long as you take care of the shaft you make sure there's not that much run out you line it up you do your maintenance on it. it's gonna last forever yeah that's um old machines like that that have lived their lives and kind of like job shops and stuff like that if they could talk they could tell some really interesting oh, stories i'm sure 
So, okay, we've got the flange cleaned up. We got the brake rotor going on. Is there any other considerations that they probably should do to the wheel itself or b before they uh, put a caliper onto it? So, just kind of same deal I had said earlier. I like to, you know, pull the entire. If you're changing brake rotors, you have to take a slider bracket off. So, I like to take that bracket off. Make sure the area where the the slide the slider bracket bolts to the spindle is nice and clean, and there's nothing like unemployable on it. That kind of deal. Make sure that stuff's nice. Throw your rotor on. Put your caliper bracket on, and then it's kind of you know make sure your sliders are free. Make sure there's no kind of crusty stuff. It's really just you know preventative maintenance and keeping all that stuff nice and moving slowly because that's the last thing you want is a, is a caliper that doesn't move properly like it's got a locked up slider because you're going to have one pad that wears significantly more than the other and you're going to get some braking issues or it could, like I said you um, can get to a point where the the pads kind of walk out and you'll get that weird you know you go you have that delayed pedal where oh, yeah. the pads it's got to take the slack up to get the thing to close so Keeping all that stuff nice and lubricated and clean and moving in your entire brake system is really important. Got a question. This came up here. How do you use a dial indicator on a drilled and slotted rotor? That's an interesting. I, I, I'm looking at this one right now. If you look at the edge, there's probably a very eighth of an inch ring on the outside, and even with barely with this one uh, to measure the total amount of run out in, uh, in in this brake rotor if you had your dial indicator so it's it's a little it's tough yeah it's, it's definitely going to be a tough kind of uh you're going to have to find a nice good spot to check it and kind of the most continuous you know uninterrupted pattern on this like andrew said is going to be either around the outside or around the very inside and you have to think your dial indicator is only the size that the tip on it's the only size of a pen very small so you you need to obviously hitting a slot is going to be an issue but kind of just checking around it, because then your dial indicator itself isn't going to move, and you're going to spin this on the surface, and you kind of just want to check different points around it to see what the actual run out, you know. You're kind of just trying to find an average almost of it and see. There's a wear spec and a run out spec for everything out there. It's just the matter of finding it. So having, being a good guy with, you know, checking a maintenance book or, you know, maintenance logs or in the days of, you know, um, the online, the uh, all data is the always yep. example I use. You know, you can you can find so much information on there; it's dangerous. But yeah, with this, you'd want to check it on the very outside of the rotor or the very inmost surface to get a complete circle around to check it. You know, it brings up the uh, the discard thickness on these, and I'm going to actually pull this one up here, and it has the actual discard thickness right here on the edge. It looks like it's been uh, laser etched or uh, I don't know what that is. Probably tapped in there with like a special uh, printing thing. It says minimum thickness uh, 27 millimeters. So it is there on the on these rotors. Yeah, so you don't even got to get a book out to check that one. They put it right on there. And that's nice because, you know, you just grab your calipers, check it. If it's below, it's, if it's close to 27 or it's below 27, you chuck that in the rotor pile to go to the scrapyard, and you run down to the auto the auto parts store and get yourself some new ones, like Summit Racing. <laughs> yep, true, true. So we've got one more question that just came in, and this was kind of a, a, an interesting question. Um, do the holes and actually let's let, we, hey we've got a video here from uh, Jack students. Do holes and slots in brake rotors increase or decrease braking performance? I think we talked about this before, defining performance. Yeah, so it is a, you know, nowadays it is more in an aesthetic look. And years previous, it was an improved, it, it, it improved braking performance because with old style asbestos pads and stuff like that, you allowed the gas to escape, gas to escape easier. And with the slot, like I said, it's coming around, knocking a brand new surface on the pad every time to give you better braking force, kind of cleaning it off, taking some of the contaminants, that kind of stuff off. So it is going to be an increase in performance, but also in a, a nice, pleasing aesthetic upgrade. So it, it, it's a kind of, you're on a seesaw there because it's, it's a yes and no question. There's not really a, a perfect answer for it. At the end of the day, 
on most vehicles, it's going to make a, a, an improvement in, in braking capability. But that's just by having, it's, it's like building a sandwich. You know, you, have, you start with a good rotor, and then you go to a good pad, and then your caliper. You're not going to gain any braking actual clamping force. So it, the brakes are going to act the same, the pedal is going to feel the same, but with a more aggressive pad, it's going to grab this better. And with a better rotor, like a drilled and slotted rotor, you're going to be able to maintain harder braking for longer versus a solid, uh, a solid rotor. Got a question that just came in on the, the YouTube here. Um, they're wondering about this rotor that's sitting out in front of us. What's the advantage to a two-piece rotor? So th this is this is race car stuff. Yep. So with a two-piece rotor like this, so you, when when it comes into a race or hot street applications, you know, rotating mass is unsprung weight is the enemy. So you want to get every they, I think they say every one pound of unsprung weight, and by un, unsprung un, unsprung weight, let's let's fuse our words here, <laughs> is any weight that is not on the suspension. So it's it's your wheels brakes, any of that stuff that's all bolted outside that doesn't is contact kind of in your spinning, your rotating mass. So every one pound of rotating mass you get rid of is like getting rid of 20 pounds on the chassis essentially. So by taking, you have this big heavy rotor. Well, if this was a conventional rotor, it'd have a big heavy steel center in it or cast. And um, that's, a lot, that's a lot of weight moving around here. So it's gonna take, it takes more umph and more braking force to slow down that rotating weight. So to cut down on weight and cut down on ro rotating mass in the name of race car, you have these aluminum hats on the inside and it makes it a two-piece rotor. So you're getting rid of all this extra heavy metal that you'd have here in the center for a nice piece of lightweight aluminum. Could that also help with the handling of the vehicle? Oh, 100%. When you're, you know, on a when you're getting rid of that weight and you're not, you know, with your steering as an example, you're moving less weight left and right. So the car, it can steer better, the thing can handle better. It's, that is a two-piece rotor is really a big performance gain. So another question that just came in here, surface area of the brake pad and also the, uh, let's even say a brake shoe. How much does that matter to the overall braking performance? Yeah. So. In fancy science words, you know, they have the coefficient of friction. You. Yeah, yeah, this is this real, you know, real big, long, it's, it, it's, it's real science stuff. So the greater surface area you have touching in a rotor to a pad, the greater coefficient of friction it has. So it's going to slow it down faster. The more contact you can put to the rotor itself, the better braking you're going to have. So that's why in a lot of, you know, performance applications, you have guys built, they have Anywhere from, you know, your conventional, say like your a, a 70s GM car. Those front calipers are just big, giant, single piston calipers. Well, when you get into kind of some race car stuff, you add, you start adding pistons to the caliper. So there's like, say like your modern, like C, say like a C8 Corvette. I, I believe those cars have, I, they're six, they're six or eight piston calipers on them. So... As you increase the brake shoe size, you know, you need to not just push in one spot on the center, you need to add more pistons to add more braking force. And so as the pad size and, and rotor increases, you need more clamping force, so you're gonna add more pistons to a caliper and the greater braking it's gonna get. So yes, friction, you know, the surface area of a pad or, you know, and or brake shoe, the greater it is, the greater stopping power it potentially has. Okay, I think we've got a troll in here on Facebook, um, and they said in a comment here, why aren't more vehicles using drum brakes if they're only using it for a limited distance, like let's say drag racing? So drum brake, it's kind of the, I kind of touched on it a little bit earlier about it's the maintenance issue of drum brakes. And so, you know, you see big class eight trucks going down the road every day and they still, they still use drum brakes. It's because in the surface area world, that is the most efficient thing for heavy, you're moving 80,000 pounds down the road. So you're gonna want as much brake as possible. So, but on a modern daily driver, something, you know, cars, cars when they had four wheel drum brakes weren't designed to last, you know, it was, they had 100,000 mile odometers in them because no one ever thought the car was gonna go that long you're just throwing it in the trash and getting a new one. 
vehicles we drive nowadays, you know, three, four. I have a vehicle that has 650,000 miles on it. <laughs> like, you, you, make, you make the stuff last. So over that time and as lifespans of vehicles have increased, you need something. This is, disc brakes are more maintenance free. They're less to manufacture. You know, I, with this, I manufacture a rotor, a pad, and a caliper. And that caliper has a handful of seals in it and a, a piston or two, nothing crazy. In a drum brake system, you know, you have your outer drum, your two inner drum pads. You have, if it's an E, if it's a rear, you have your E-brake, your whole E-brake brackets and your little spinner. Everybody's had those little brake adjusters with the little spinny yep. wheel. And, you know, us being here in Ohio, you know, we drive in that wonderful salt and all that stuff. That stuff gets in there, it corrodes, well, those get stuck and they don't adjust correctly. And they, the, the stuff... It doesn't. La it's not as meant to last as long, and it's uh, there's a lot more parts to be made there, and so it drives manufacturing cost up. So between manufacturing cost and the simplicity of a disc brake system, it's disc brakes. If it's it's the step in technology past drum brakes. Do drum brakes still have an everyday application, and we use them all the time, and they still work really great? But in the grand scheme of things, disc brakes are cheaper to use and maintain. Got like an interesting question here. Would you make fun of me if I just installed drilled and soldered rotors on the front of my vehicle? Should I replace all four at the same time? I mean, we've all been there. I'll be the first. Same to here. Say, same here. Yep. Yeah, Friday comes around. You're buying parts down in the, at the at the parts house, and uh, buying four rotors and uh, two sets of pads, and well, I should say four four sets of pads and some other stuff, that that can hurt the pocketbook a little bit. And that, that makes, you know, having a good time on a Saturday night a little harder. So, you know, you uh, you just gotta go with it. It's if, if you can afford to buy two rotors and two pads this week and two more next week and do two brake jobs, that's, you do you. That's, uh, everybody wants to replace them at the same time, but, uh, you know, between time and, you know, sometimes your pocketbook doesn't allow that. So. Rock the slotted rotors on the front for a while and get to the backs when you can. <laughs> that's, that, that, that's true. You know what? And you're spending money on a modification that makes your vehicle actually probably safer in the long run. Yeah. So you're not taking a, a thing and putting a horrible exhaust system on it? No, it's way cooler. Putting slotted and drilled rotors and a good set of brake pads on the front of your vehicle is way cooler than putting all those little Amazon lights and the little bobblehead dog on the dash. <laughs> like, true. It's a, it's, a, it's a real investment in your vehicle and, and you know, you're... It's going to be great for uh, down the road. Um, okay, this question just came in here. Let me see. This is one of Jack's students again. Uh, what are some of the holes and slot designs, and how can they differ, and uh, do they actually change performance? So you'll see there, there's kind of two big variations. Then you have a dimple, and then you have a full drill, a, a full drill through. So with the the dimple is going to do the same thing that the drill does the full drilled hole does in the aspect of it coming by and allowing you know some kind of gas to get caught in that pocket but the full drilled drilled through hole is going to be way more efficient at that okay and i know you know you if you go to the summit uh, racing website you'll see different designs i know like dba disc brakes australia um power slot they all have their different ones and it's it's it could each make sure you read the description of the product. Yeah, to get each their each take manufacturer on it. has what they think their proof in the pudding kind of design and recipe is, and it's going to vary, vary manufacturer to manufacturer. Everybody, you know, that's what drives innovation in in any aspect, from brakes to you know engine building, all that is the variances and seeing whose design works best, and that's what drives the industry forward is to make something come up with something better. So. In the aspects of drilled and slotted rotors, it is not all the same, but they're all working on the same basic principle, and they're just, everybody's trying to achieve the same thing in their best way. So you're gonna see multiple designs and kind of different stuff, like uh, a really common one is you kind of see the, the J-hook slots that they kind of cut, and they'll put like a little, has like a little tail off it, and that's always, you know, those are really popular and really common. Yeah, isn't it EBC? Yes, EBC is the one that does that. Okay. So, and there's, like I said, there's there's so many big names in the brake pad industry. Like, um, like I said, we have Power Stop here. We have EBC, um, Stop Tech, Willwood. There's uh, Hawk makes some re really awesome brake pads. There's there's some really really great manufacturers out there. So you have plenty of options for basically anything you 
and you drive. And that's like one thing we like at Summit is we like to be able to say we have something for everything you drive from, you know, your, your RV to your race car to your pickup truck to your wife's minivan. You should be able, you can get brake parts at, at, for anything at, at, right at Summit Racing. Okay, got a question coming here. The hat design. Um, if I had this road right here, another question from this person. Could I just change out just the, uh, yeah, you could change out just the, uh, the hat itself. You don't have to change out the whole rotor. Yeah, so when you get into a performance set of rotors oh. like this, you're, a, you're able to buy just the outside rotor itself. You don't have to buy the hat every time. And so and if you're ever changing those, it's very, very important. You know, I, I'll admit to my own mistake. I have had one of these hats come unbolted from the outside of the rotor before, and it is a party. It is not a good time. It, uh, it makes <laughs> you think a little bit. So like when I like to do these, I like to use fresh, you know, you're changing them. I recommend you use fresh hardware, Loctite, and then if it's provisioned for holes to safety wire them, I highly recommend you safety wire them. If they're not, they sell some cool little jigs that you can actually take and drill your holes, your bolts for safety wire. Yep. and install it and that is a whole nother art on top of itself is safety wiring bolts because it's monotonous and it takes a lot of time and it's not that fun because you you know stab yourself in the thumb seven times with all this little wire but yep. in the safety aspect of it you're not only protecting your own life with that peace of mind you're protecting the others you're using the car around <laughs> yeah i just bought the jig to do the bolts to do safety wire and it, it's an art because you look at some of them and it, it's you're right you look at behind the brake rotor and how they have it crisscrossing around the different bolts it's like I, I i don't think i could ever do that yeah there's a, there's a whole method to the safety wire madness especially when it comes to brake rotors and you have to think like in in military spec stuff and like on aircrafts they safety wire every the whole yep. every bolt on the thing is safety wired so it's you know if the military is not too good to do it I, i'm not too good to do it and i'll just <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll take a you know i'll go ahead and take the time and make sure that stuff's done like i said just for a little peace of mind and some safety so we got a question here. How much does this big brake rotor weigh? And lucky enough, I've got a scale right here. I haven't measured this one yet. Do you want to take a guess on how much it's going to weigh? Ooh, just looking at her, she's got to be a good. She she's got to be a good twenty pounds. Let's see here. Thirty-one point one four. Ooh, she's she's thick. That is thick. But I bet you, if you did a rotor like this, cast like this, it would weigh a lot more. Oh yeah, I get the just having that aluminum hat in the center has has to cut down on the weight substantially, and that's you know, like I said, for every pound you cut out of on you know rotating mass, it's like taking twenty pounds off your chassis. So you're going to notice a. Um, I noticed a big difference on a car going from steel wheels to aluminum wheels, and the thing felt like it had a bigger engine. You had so much more throttle control at the pedal, and it's just, when you don't have to snap, when, especially in drag racing, when you're going from zero to you know, letting go of a trans brake button and that whole turn, you know, you're taking everything from moving zero to as fast as you can get it out of the hole. Getting rid of that weight makes a difference. It, it takes a lot of umph to spin up a bunch of weight. So let's do another comparison. Let's say you've got a Corvette 2017, oh, I'm sorry, Camaro ZL1, and you go from that brake kit in the back, to maybe something like this, with your strange rear end, we make bets on how much this thing weighs? Oh, it's seven, eight pounds. Let's see here. Ooh. Ooh, she's light. She's light. So 4.5. Yeah, we'll call it, about, call it about a, you know, four and a quarter weight-wise. Now, the adverse effect of that, and, you know, that rotor Andrew had in his hand, that is a strict race application rotor. You, it would not make it very long on the street for street braking or extended braking because you got rid of all that weight there, but the rotor's really thin. Like, what would you call that, Andrew? That's a half an inch thick? Half an inch, if, if, if that. I mean, it's pretty... So... That's going to heat up substantially faster than one of these big giant drilled and slotted, like I said, this two-piece rotor we have here. So 
that's going to collect heat more, that heat's going to transfer into your pads and your calipers, and with a thin rotor like that, if you try to drive it on the street, you would get brake fade really, really fast, and you would, you know, your brakes would get all spongy, and then you really have no brakes, and there's not a good time, you know, you're, you're looking for something big, hard, big and hard to stop you at that point, because when you have no brakes, there's not, it's, it's not fun. I think this is out of the Willowood catalog, and I think this is used for drag racing rear ends. And it's also used for uh, sprint cars. Yeah, so that's that's a very strict race application compared to, you know, a rotor like this, like this two-piece job we have sitting here. Could this is a you know a street and strip or a street and track kind of rotor? You'll be able to drive that to work and not worry about it. You try to drive to work on those and stop. They're going to heat up really fast, and it's not going to be a good time. So, in general, how long should these brake rotors last on a vehicle? Same amount as an, a normal undrilled and slotted brake rotor. So in that, in th in theory, yes, and that's a big kind of. It really depends on kind of what kind of driving you're doing, how aggressively you brake in the car, and your pad con your pad compound as well. So a really hard set of aggressive pads that that are have a lot of braking force, or I shouldn't say braking force that have a the potential for a lot of braking force depends a lot on your your caliper itself. A, an aggressive pad is going to wear this rotor substantially faster than, say, you know, an organic brake pad or, you know, kind of your OE pad. And I just got this text email from one of our um, instructors, because he's watching it on YouTube right now on his computer, didn't want to interrupt. He is wondering, how should you inspect for cracks on a rotor, and when should you be concerned that a crack is abnormal and you should get it off the vehicle immediately? So any, any cracking you see around a vent or a drill hole is bad. That is bad news. It got, you know, with this stuff and especially with, you know, rotors are made out of cat, you know, cast iron or cast steel, you heat cycle these things all the time. So, you know, it gets hot, it grows, it cools down all the time. Driving it to work, do it, it's, it's, it's hard on parts. So as soon as you start to see cracks kind of off the vent holes and stuff like that, it's time to replace them. They, they are not safe to drive on. That's the last thing you want to do is have a, you know, a crack grow and a whole piece of rotor come off or, you know, something even worse. Seven more minutes left in this uh, live cast, so please keep your comments and questions coming in. And that's, you know, the people who are concerned with, you know, I'm putting a hole in my rotor. I don't want to, you know, make it a chance to have a crack. But have you ever seen the cracks that occur around a hole of uh, a drilled uh, and soldered rotor? So that's... Uh, Nine times out of ten, if you're going to have a crack start, it, it's going to start at one of one of the drill holes themselves. So you've you know you've took meat out of there, you've added an a an open surface in there. So naturally, that's going to where a crack's going to kind of progress from. I've also seen them come off the you know we talked about the chamfering on the outside of the rotors earlier. Yep. I've seen some kind of lower end kind of not not a high quality brake rotor when they're not chamfered on the outside, and a crack start at the outside and, and work its way in. So a, anyway, in this, you know, in this application, you know, you know, cracks are whack. You don't, you want to, if, it, if it's cracked, you just throw it in the trash. There's, it, it's not worth your life or somebody else's to try to save a few bucks and kind of progress that rotor along. Another question that just came in, how should the hat fit on the flange of the vehicle? Should there be some play back and forth because these holes may be a little bit too big? So when you bolt with like a full, you know, what they like to call a, when it's, when it's like that, it's a full, a full floating rotor. Yep. So you slide it on, there is going to be, it should, back and forth on the lugs, it should have a little play, but as for sliding it on, the back, you know, this back is nice and machined flat, your hub is nice and machined flat, it should only move in back and forth like this, not side to side like this. Yeah. So it's kind of a, what they like to call a hub-centric fit. So, you know, the center in here on your hub, you'll have an outside bore, and it should be a nice kind of, not so much a snug to where you need to beat it on, but, you know, it should slide on there and it should stay in place. It shouldn't have lateral or sideways movement, but as for sitting on the lug studs itself, it, having a little bit of back and forth, because once you put, you know, you bolt your wheel on and then you torque your wheel, and a lot of these also too have a small like a Phillips head screws. That's always kind of everybody likes. You get into a car and you're doing a brake job and everything's kind of crusty. You get that uh, the um, the whack a screwdriver. It's uh, I can't remember the actual name of it, but they you know they they come in a little blue case. And everyone turns like, like yeah. a few degrees. It's a uh, 
I can't remember the actual name of the tool itself, but you know, that's what you have two, usually uh, one or two bolts that'll actually bolt it to a hub. So like, um, and it'll be like a Phillips screw. M most of the time it's a Phillips screw. So you get that little whack a hammer out and you put it in there and you smack it, get that Phillips screw out and your rotor comes right off. Another uh, product question here. Uh, should you be painting rotors and what type of paint should I be using to paint my rotors? So if you're going to paint your rotors, you're going to you're going to want to be very careful kind of, you know, mask out the actual braking surface. You don't want any paint on the braking surface itself because that is anti-performance. That's going to contaminate your brake pads. So if you're going to paint the inside, I I'd, I'd recommend uh, so they make really good high like a high heat, high temperature paints. You know, kind of rough this thing up with some sandpaper, throw some of that high temp paint on it because your brakes are going to get hot like this is compared next to the actual combustion chamber of the engine, this is the hottest part on the vehicle is your brakes itself. That's an interesting question. Yeah, I, you know, you see online of people painting these rotors and they'll just paint the entire thing and then throw the brake pads on there and just hopefully, you know. Oh, oh that, is so, that is so scary to me. But, you know, that's, that's how you learn, but you don't want to learn at the expense of kind of, you know, your safety. So it's very important that this surface is clean when you put brand new rotors on, even used rotors. You know, you if you're just doing a brake pad change, because you don't have to replace your rotors every time you put brake pads on it. These rotors kept in good condition and brake system that's maintained, you know, rotors should last more than one set of brake pads in, you know, a regular daily driver application. So keeping this stuff like, you know, you take it all apart. That's another thing, you know, grab your can of brake clean and your rag and kind of just wipe, you know, wipe the thing off. Wipe the, you'll get... With these drilled and slotted rotors, you'll notice a lot of times you'll get brake dust and that kind of build up in the slots and in the holes and stuff from the pads, you know, wearing down. So it's very important that, you know, when you replace your pads, just kind of take, pop the rotor off, sit there, clean the thing up, inspect it, make sure there's no cracks, anything weird going on, and then bolt it back on the car and kind of go about the rest of your brake job. Brian's got a question here. I think this is a good one. I put bigger wheels and tires on my truck. Should I upgrade the brakes too? So that's, that's kind of a, you know, you, you have room to grow there then. That's a really common swap that I see on like GM trucks as a lot of dudes go to the 17 inch wheels or the 18s and even 20s and go to the, the big GM brakes. So I, I believe it goes from a, a 14 inch rotor up to a 16 or 17 if, I, if I'm not mistaken. But that's the thing is you put bigger wheels and tires, you know, if you took 16 inch steel wheels off and you put a 20 inch aluminum wheel on, you, you haven't really made a, a big difference there. But if I had, you know, 16 inch wheels with a 35 or a 38 inch mud terrain on them, yeah. where you've added all that rotating mass, well, now you're, you have more stuff moving. It's a, it's a lot greater weight. So maybe upgrading your brakes is something you should think about. And PowerStop offers some awesome truck, con they, they do braking kits just for trucks and kind of, you know, Truck, doing truck stuff, towing and beat, you know, that kind of stuff you do. And they have some really great options for, you know, a, a towing, a more towing brake pad. Because that's a big thing is like when you're towing a big tray, you know, your race car trailer or your camper and stuff like that, you've then bolted all this weight on your truck. And now you're relying on your truck's braking system, not only to stop the vehicle itself, but the camper itself. And, you know, for you can go all the way up to 24,000 pounds can you know combined gross weight in a pickup truck you know that that's that's a lot of weight that's a lot of meat moving down the highway you definitely need, need great pads and rotors well Justin we've come to the end of the hour here um, thank you very much for answering these questions and thanks for Summit Racing for sponsor the, sponsoring this for uh, tomorrow's technician I think this is a, a great opportunity to interact with the students and uh, for them to ask questions and uh, I thank you, Justin, and uh, thank you, Summit Racing. Anything you'd like to add, Justin? No, um, thanks for, for having me. I really appreciate it. Like I said, I kind of like answering these kind of questions and doing this kind of stuff to um, you know, inspire tomorrow's technician. Well, thank you very much, guys, for attending. Uh, if you're watching this on the on-demand version, thank you, too.